Hello listeners and welcome to this week's episode of The Cult Fault. I'm your speaker Casey and this week we start by saying hello, welcome and thank you so much for the support of the two newest patrons, Jordan and Lauren. Your names have been added to the sponsorship section of my website and you now have access to a backlog of exclusive content. Thank you so much for choosing my platform. The continued support of my patrons and sponsors allows me to continue delivering this weekly content. Don't forget, by following my social media accounts across October, liking and commenting on any October posts, you will be automatically entered into a giveaway competition where you could win a copy of Helen Zuman's memoir, Mating in Captivity. Her first-hand account of time spent on Zendik Farm with a group that had a radical take on sex and relationships. You can listen to my interview with Helen on episode 7 of the podcast. You can find my social media accounts on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Patreon, etc. at Cult Vault Pod. This week we return to the subject of troubled teens and institutionalised abuse in the hopes of highlighting as many of these wilderness camps and so-called therapeutic boarding schools as possible. And today we will be discussing two different places attended by the same person. The Wilderness Programme Second Nature based in Utah and Spring Ridge Academy in Arizona. Here to talk us through her experiences in both programmes is Maggie. So hi Maggie and welcome to the podcast. It's so great to have you here today to come and share your experience and shed more light on this troubled teen industry. Would you like to start by introducing yourself to the listeners? Um, yeah, hi. So I'm Maggie and um, I'm a survivor of Second Major Uintals and Spring Ridge Academy. These are two separate programs in two different areas. Yeah, two separate programs. Um, Second Nature is a uh, wilderness therapy program that um, is based in um, a small town called Duchesne in the state of Utah. And um, Spring Ridge Academy is a therapeutic boarding school in um, northern Arizona. Right. And how far, for for people that aren't, kind of familiar with the area how far away are those in in miles or hours from each other yeah, yeah um yeah I I'm not sure like from each other I think um so Utah is just the state just above Arizona so um I don't know maybe like driving would be like 10 to 15 hours wow okay okay because to get from one end of like England to the other is maybe like yeah. eight, eight hours so so it's kind of like a car journey yeah. across yeah. across the country of England what age were you when you attended your first program um I was 16 when I was sent away first okay and this was to to second nature yeah this was to the wilderness program okay okay and what what were the reasons for you being sent to this wilderness program um, yeah, so mostly um, the initial reason why I was like sent away was m- more likely just like effectively on my parents' end was like academic underachievement. Like I think is the um, main reason behind it. I I like was skipping school and um, I wasn't super interested in school and my parents didn't particularly like that and I wanted to. I I was, yeah, I wasn't happy in school. And um, I think that my parents didn't really know what to do. And then I was getting in trouble and um, like drinking and smoking, but like nothing at this point that like I realize now is anything that's like that unusual um, Mm -hmm. or like normal teenage behavior. Mm -hmm. But um, it wasn't even the fact that I was like drinking and smoking was like the main reason I was sent away. Either my parents didn't really care that much about that if like I had been interested in actually attending school. Right. Okay. So what what type of upbringing did you have at this point? Was was there sort of any any attending church or were your parents very uh, academically driven themselves? Yeah. So um, I think that like we're both of the programs um, I went to kind of differ from a lot of the trouble teen industry. Um, Second Nature is a major wilderness program that a lot of people go to, but um, they're not, but neither of the ones that are particularly religiously affiliated, like they're actually not religiously affiliated. Um, right. I wasn't really raised um, 
with any like religious affiliation that much. Um, I think that there was like points where my parents would like try to get us to go to church sometimes, but it was never that important. Um, so like I had a pretty secular upbringing. Mm-hmm. Um, when you say us, I'm, I'm guessing there's brothers and sisters. Yeah, I have an older brother as well. Right. Okay. Okay. So what, what do you think was their main push towards you becoming sort of a, an academic achiever? Is it, is it because they, they just hoping for the best for you employment wise with your prospects once you leave education? Or is it because they are kind of very, very driven with further education themselves? Um. I mean, they're not necessarily, I think, that driven with further education themselves. I think that, um, like, I think that there was a bit of a, like, a status thing um, about, uh, like, what they wanted me to fit into, to fit into a sort of um, mold that was in our little community that we grew up in, that, like, I needed to have gone to, like, this school and do this and go to this, like, university and, like, you know, fit into this mold. And I Mm. didn't. And I I think that just in general, I kind of, from from when I was like quite young was always a bit of a rebel and like, didn't really fall in line with everything that they kind of wanted me to be. Mm -hmm. So I think that they, this was kind of like the last straw for them. Um, Right. Yeah. And they weren't really too happy with me, like being around and like effectively like marching to the beat of my own drum when you say that this was the last straw do you remember any other types of intervention that your parents attempted with you before it got to this stage of the wilderness program um well I was actually uh um I so I actually attended a a couple of different um like high schools because um I again like I struggled and then the first school I was at was the one that they really wanted me to be at but then I was actually really heavily bullied at that school right and um then I just switched to um a local public school um for like my second year of high school and um then um after that like I was kind of skipping class and not doing things that like they wanted me to do and I was miserable there that they ended up um I first was then sent they sent me to just a regular boarding school not of the therapeutic uh variety yeah yeah. and um there actually I don't think they did very much research about the actual school that I was like they I was going to because it was kind of like a my parents are very conservative and um this school was like almost like a it was it was very like um progressive very liberal like and they gave uh students there like quite a bit of personal freedom and it was great for me because I um like felt like I mean they treated us more like adults than um like students ourselves but like because of that I kind of went like crazy and that not really crazy but there wasn't a ton of supervision so it was really easy for me not to do the things that I was supposed to be doing and so there I ended up getting in like actually properly getting into quite a bit of trouble um, more so like getting caught, like smoking or drinking and like things like that. And, um, I, I was in trouble in school. I wasn't on the verge of being, um, like there was some disciplinary action and stuff that like they had right there. But I think that, um, my parents were upset with the fact that I wasn't being supervised or in like a structured enough environment. Mm -hmm. And, um, I was also like struggling with my mental health as well at that time. Um, I, uh, um, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I was struggling with my mental health a lot at that time. Like I was severely depressed. I really like struggled to sort of, um, make friends and, um, keep them. I had a lot of social anxiety and okay. stuff. So, um, I, and at that time too, like I had actually been in, my parents had me seeing a therapist. Um, but at the, the therapist that I was seeing then would also, I wasn't like, I wasn't totally truthful with her about things that were going on in my life because she would just report everything I said back to them. Okay. Um, That's it. That's, that's like a, is that like a breach of confidentiality or, or was she, was she supposed to do that because of your age? Yeah. I don't think that like, I, I've, I've really, like, I mean, I think it's unethical just from like someone's Mm, own like mm -hmm. standpoint, but I actually don't think there's nothing illegal about it because I was a minor. So, um, Yeah. And so like at that point, yeah. So I had been seeing this therapist and she was actually, I think the one that put my parents in contact with, 
um, an educational consultant uh, who then recommended that I go to that wilderness program. Right. Second okay. Teacher. Okay. Yeah. And do you, I don't know if it's just me kind of looking for all the red flags immediately from, from previous interviews I've done, but do you think that this person was maybe like on a, a kick commission, a commission yeah. basis? Right. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I do. I actually have like, this is just more of a, like a theory of mine, but, um, I ended up, um, sort of com- coming into kind of someone I went to, um, like primary school with, um, and, uh, like just chatting with her a little bit who, um, also like it had turned out cause I, um, had turned out had gone to, uh, had, is also a survivor of the troubled teen industry had been sent to two different programs, um, later on. And she left this like school. I hadn't seen her since we were like 12, maybe 13. Um, and I know that like she had gone to the same therapist as well that I went okay, to. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And it's not like, um, like I didn't, I grew up in like a suburb of Phoenix, Arizona. So it's like, it's a major city. It's not like it's a small town, but then like, it was a pretty like small ish sort of community and stuff. So there's not, there weren't like a ton of like options, I think, um, for like therapists who would, you know, specialize in, um, like teenage girl issues, I suppose. Okay. So when this, when this person approaches your parents and says I have a potential solution for your your difficulties here Mm -hmm. your parents are looking at this program thinking it has the potential to kind of solve all the the issues that you've all been having as a family unit yeah I mean I think it's basically like okay cool they can like have them fix her basically right right and and did they have a discussion with you before the decision was made on on you attending this program no no I was told that I was going like on the way oh my goodness okay so talk us through what that was like yeah so um I like kind of I just need to remember like the like what led to this like the timeline I'm a little bit hazy on um but I Like I said, I was at like a regular boarding school before then, and I was really struggling with my mental health and health, and I was really unhappy. And I remember um, calling my dad in like close to tears, just because like I felt like I needed something, I needed some help somewhere somehow, because but like I felt like I wasn't like I just Mm -hmm. I was I mean so like in such like a pit of depression that it's like kind of hard for me to even like remember how bad it was. Okay, yeah if that kind of happens. And then um, what feels like I want to say the next day, but um, I don't know if it was the next day. Uh, uh, Both my parents like had come up to the school I was at because I was in, um, where I was going to school was only probably about a two, it was like about a two hour drive from um, where my parents lived. Okay. Um, so like they, it wasn't that far away, but it was far enough away. Uh, so, um, they like came and they like picked me up in the morning. And like, I think that I knew I was leaving. I knew that like something was changing and I was probably, I just felt like I was going to go to another school because I'd been switching schools so much of course, that I figured yeah. it was like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to another school now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was like in the car as they like were telling me like, okay, well, you're going to this wilderness therapy program. And by the way they were describing it to me was that I kind of like sort of pictured it was going to be, you know, like a summer camp, but with a little bit of therapy involved. Mm -hmm. Um, I wonder if that's what their visions of the program were as well, if that's their interpretation of what they thought it was going to be. Um, I'm not sure. I think like at one point I brought it up to my mom and she was like, oh, well, I don't know because like we looked at so many and like I couldn't keep them all straight. Right, Um, okay, okay. I'm not sure if that's like the truth or not. Um, Mm -hmm. When somebody says wilderness program to me, that's what I picture. I picture like scouts or guides or brownies and that kind of environment. Yeah, like, I mean, I'd gone to like that when I was like younger and everything. And I was already already, like fairly outdoorsy, I think my mom like told me there would be horses and I grew mm-hmm. up riding horses and everything. Um, so I was like compliant. I was like, okay, this yeah. sounds like yeah. it'll be good. And they're like, it's six weeks. And like six weeks is not a problem. Like, and so I was, yeah, I was 
like pretty compliant about it. I didn't um, I feel like I had any reason like not like to, yeah. to object yeah. to it. Yeah, um, yeah. When that happened. So um, like they drove like me like basically like direct from school like to the airport. Um, and then like, I thought it was like a little bit like odd. Cause like, I didn't really, again, like I didn't really know what I was in for. And I was like completely fine with going, um, that they had, like, they walked me direct to the gate. Like they had some special, um, like exemption, even though they weren't flying with me, like they came with me directly to the gate, like through security and everything, which I thought was weird that they were doing that. Um, and then I do know like my mom wouldn't let me go to the bathroom alone which I also thought was like super strange. Um, and then I remember like, um, but then I flew to Salt Lake City, um, which is the capital of Utah alone. Um, and I got off the plane and I knew I was supposed to like meet people there who were from the program, like directly off the plane. And there were like two people on the plane and they didn't recognize me because at the time I had dyed my hair like fire engine red Right. And my mom hated it and pretended that wasn't my hair color. I had told them I just had brown hair. Um, and so I don't think that they recognized me right away. And I introduced myself to them, which then like later on, I was like, why did I do this? I could have just walked <laughs> past them. Um, and they had like, ho- like the um, airport security with them and everything too. Like, I think because they thought I could have like run or been quite difficult. And I like, I like walked past and I was like, though, like, you're the people, hello. Um, instead, um, and like, to like, there's part of me, like to this day that like wonders like what I would have done. Like, I actually have like family in Salt Lake that like, didn't agree with me being sent away or anything that, Mm -hmm. um, like, I wonder like what would have happened had I just not done that. I do wonder as well, if your parents were given explicit instructions on how to guide you through the airport and then what would happen with you on the other side in terms of preempting difficult behavior. So maybe this this kind of routine has come from the staff of the wilderness program having these issues with teenagers being sent through who are going sort of against their will and their parents Mm -hmm. have dropped them off on one side and then the staff are on the plane and then at the at the other end to to escort the children um, and the young adults who have then been like I'm not going with you. So then airport security have had to get involved to help the staff escort the teenagers from the building. Yeah, I think that's exactly like what it was because um, like when I found those two people, it was like a man and a woman um, there. And then I was like chatting with them like just a little bit, like before mm-hmm. we like left the, like just the gate um, of the airport. Then um, I remember the guy like turned to the security guard and he was like, yeah, I think we're okay. Um, right. Cause right. like, I, I didn't know, like at that point, like, I just like, I didn't know like why I think that it sort of like crossed my mind a little bit. Like, yeah, maybe some people like aren't that compliant with this, but like, I, I just, I didn't have any clue about like these programs at all or like what I was being sent to. And like, mm-hmm. like I said, like, I honestly legitimately thought it was going to be like, you know, like hiking campfires and then like therapy, yeah, which yeah. seemed okay. It, like, when you when you word it like that, it sounds great. It sounds it sounds like what all of us need occasionally. You know, you need a bit of a yeah. break and a bit of a chill out, kind of in the middle of nowhere, and and then a little bit of, of therapy, which might just be sitting down with a friend and a bottle of wine. Um, yeah, exactly. Or, or not when you're a teenager, but when you know, yeah, I'm obviously. talking like when I say this is what we all need. I mean, kind of me mm-hmm. as a 28 year old. Yeah. <laughs> um. So I wonder if. If you know if this wilderness program would get children sent through the from the courts who are who are kind of mandated to attend the programs and and it's not particularly a choice of the parents. So I don't think that this one is um like would be a court mandated one. Right. I okay. think that it's like it's a lot of like there's a lot of money involved in these ones. I don't think that like right. it's I mean basically the way I see it like at this point it's like it's a money making operation. So they're not really mm-hmm. gonna make a lot of money if it's like paid for by the taxpayer. And do you know how much your parents paid for you to attend this six week program? Um I don't I don't know how much they paid. I, I've actually like I was um 
even before this interview, I was trying to um, see what their fees are now because it is still open. Um, right. Okay. Uh, at the time when I went, which was um, about like about 10 years ago, um, a little bit more now, but um, there were multiple um, branches of Second Nature, but now it's literally just the only, the only one that exists is the one that okay. I went to. And is it still so, called Second Nature today? Yeah, but my one, I think I say Second Nature Uintas because that's what it was called then because there were other ones. There was one in um, like Southern Utah. There was one in um, the state of Georgia. Um, there, I think there was one in Oregon. Oregon. Um, mm-hmm. But um, so like I, I, you know, specify which one I went to, but I'm pretty sure like now this is the only one. Okay. And it's now just called like, I think something like second nature wilderness therapy or something along those lines. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So you're at the airport, you've met the staff, airport security are kind of like, okay, we'll leave you to it. What mm-hmm. happens, what happens from there? Um, we like get in the car and like start driving. And then this is like some context on like my end that when I start like sort of thinking what's happening is that like we get in the car, I didn't have anything with me either. That was the other thing is that like I, my parents assured me that everything was like going to be at like the thing. So I literally could just have like a handbag and, um, like nothing else, but the clothes on my back basically. Um, but I wasn't really thinking about, um, I was coming from Arizona, which um, I was going to school in Northern Arizona, which is cold, but not like snowy, like covered in snow, freezing cold all the time um, in the wintertime. This is February and um, landing in Salt Lake City, which is a fair bit further North and like right next to like a major ski resort and everything. I don't, it didn't cross my mind that like it was gonna be, you know, like feet of snow. Um, outside and like very freezing and then I was like like I think then I started hit me hitting me that's like oh this isn't like summer camp it's freezing outside mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um and yeah I just remember like driving um uh, I I again like I don't actually remember much of the drive like to um the actual offices like before I went out into like the woods or whatever um I ended up looking it up I think it's like a, like later that I think it was about a three-hour drive Okay. Um, from Salt Lake City um, to the town of Duchesne, where um, the like, main office was. Um, I don't really remember what happened on that drive, like at all. I think that they were like trying to explain to me like what was ha- what was going to happen, and I think that like at that point, like maybe like some red flags were going off in my head. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I remember that I. St- I can't remember where this was. I think it was still in, like, I think it was probably once we reached the town. Um, I had like a, like a doctor's exam, like a physical. Right. Um, and then like, I know that they like gave me a blood test and like pregnancy tested me, drug tested me. And then like, maybe sit down and tell them like any drug I've ever done. And I was like, at that point, I was like, I've only like ever, I, I, I'd only ever smoked weed and they didn't believe me. And like, you know, it's just, we're going to find out anyway. And I'm like, right. Hey, so like- <laughs> that, that, that good old therapy starting, starting before you've even arrived at the, at the actual site. Yeah. And, um, so I remember that happening and I was just kind of like, and at that point too, like, I was like, I wasn't trying to hide anything. I didn't feel like I needed to. And I was still yeah. trying to be like, look, this could help me. Like I was, I was like, not, I, I needed help somehow. I was like really struggling with my mental health, basically. And um yeah, so um You're like I got off the plane, I come, I got yeah. in the vehicle, I'm here with you now, I've smoked a bit of weed. I yeah, I I what, what drank a bit. Like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um and like that was that was kind of it. And then um I remember then like they were like kind of outfitting me then I was like about to like go into the field basically um and like I think it's at this point where it really kind of started to hit me that like this wasn't what it was sold to me as right as like a um oh you know what is that the other thing I actually do remember something from that drive is that um I remember one of the like people like on the drive like asked me so like how long did your parents say that you were going to be gone for I was like, oh, they told me six weeks. They're like, yeah, you're going to be gone for longer. 
And wow. I'm like, okay. okay. And I remember like seeing there, like they tell parents six weeks, but no one ever stays for six weeks. It's always longer. Um, oh, that's, oh, that's, that's awful. Yeah. And so I remember sort of thinking that, but I didn't really believe it. Um, because I was kind of like, yeah, but I'll be there for six weeks. It was kind of my feeling. It's like, yeah, but I'm like, I'm already doing so well. Can't you tell? <laughs> like that kind of thing. Um, yeah. But that's basically them omitting that, that the, that the, the teenagers are systematically set up so that they stay longer so that the programs can charge the parents more. They're, they're basically, that's what they've just told you right there and then. I mean, that's entirely it. They try to keep, they try to keep the people, they try to te- keep the people there as long as possible to like squeeze as much money out of the parents as possible. Oh my goodness. Um, again, like, I'm not sure how much it costs. I was like trying to figure it out even now how much it costs. And they're not, they're not um, upfront with their fees. Like they make you contact them and go through like a whole thing um, to be able to find out their fees. Um, and I haven't done that. Uh, so, but um, based off of what I think my parents are paying and what I am fairly certain our uh, overhead was of like each person, each like, um, kids is basically there mm-hmm. they were turning a very large profit um so uh yeah I remember that so then like when they're outfitting me for the um like I finally in the base camp I've done like the physical exam and everything and like it's at that point where um it like really hits me that this isn't like what it's going to be because like right it, it then turns into like a full strip search that oh, I had my goodness. to okay, strip okay like completely naked, like squat and cough and turn around and like do like jumping jacks. (laughs) So you're 16 Um, at this, at this time. Yeah. And they're like two adults, like in there, just sort of like looking at me one, uh, one man, I believe like from, this is my recollection and one woman in there. And like, there's no niceties anymore. Like they were being like kind of nice beforehand. And then it was just sort of like the sort of, I remember the attitude toward me changing about like people not really, they weren't like, they were treating me as a problem. It just sort of felt like the attitude toward me had changed. And the, the man and woman in the room, are they are they the qualified doctors or physicians that are giving you like- No, a, there were a, no doctors in there. This was just the staff. Right. Um, so I'm not sure what qualifications they have. When had. you said that you went for like a full body checkup, who's taken blood from you? That was at a doctor. And then I went back to the thing. So they, I think like, this is it. I, I think, cause I went to like a proper doctor because um, about a year ago, I actually managed to get my records from them. And I saw like the doctor exam and it was actually from a doctor. Um, but the strip search before this was at a different day. Like I went from the doctor's office to like the uh, main office of the, uh, like wilderness program where then there was the strip search. So why do you, why, why did that need to happen if you'd already had a full body exam at the doctor's office? I don't understand why you then need to, are they, are they trying to see if you're smuggling some like paraphernalia drugs. or something yeah I mean I think that's exactly it they're trying to say you're smuggling drugs or something like that like I had like I mean I had been with these people the entire time I had just found out like but I think they you know it's like protocol and like I didn't really like I think that like I had effectively at that point kind of gone numb and I think that like what had like switched in my brain at that point was like okay the best thing that I'm just gonna do with this is just gonna do it and not say anything because I feel like it's going to be worse if I try not to. That is so, oh, I can't, oh, it's, it's, it makes me feel so uncomfortable and it just seems so unnecessary. If it's something, if, if they want you to be strip searched or searched for drugs that I, I feel like that there needs to be a, at least like a conversation with you before that happens or dealt with in a more respectable I just first of all I don't think it needs to happen second of all it, yeah, it doesn't need to happen it doesn't need to happen like you you've been on a plane are you not searched in security like where have you been who who have you stopped and spoken to other than the staff of, of exactly of the of the of the program since you, you got off the plane after going through security and got in their car on on the other end and then you've been to the doctor's 
and mm -hmm. then you move on and it's the staff of the program themselves that are subjecting you to this basically sexual assault I I, I don't yeah. like sexual it feels like assault in some way yeah and I it guess does in my me. mind it feels like sexual assault because you're you're basically like being forced to, to into a cavity search I mean it is like because I don't there's no choice like, it, I mean, it's exactly what it, I mean, I just like remember like hearing that, like, and it was because at the time it was sort of like they were, I was supposed to take off the clothes that I had on and mm -hmm. then put on the clothes that they were giving me. Mm -hmm. And in that time, like that, they were just giving me the, like, which was um, like standard issue. It was like, like, like military surplus clothing, like these uh, like khaki um, like pants and like the, even the girls had to wear like boxer shorts um for underwear and um like yeah so I I just I was thinking and we only got we didn't get there and like it was like a like a really itchy wool sweater and mm. um I can't like that's what I remember and like uh I mean I think that yeah so anyway I was like changing into that and we didn't really get we had like two changes of clothes um from what I remember on that uh and so it was like, that was the thing is like, that's where they were like taking the things that I had. And then I was like effectively like uh, changing into like their uniform. Okay. Um, then. And what happens after this really awful interaction? Like, are you then taken to where you're going to be staying? Are you introduced to other residents that are within the wilderness program? Yeah, so um, after after that, like I think like the intake basically. Um, after that, then I got back into the car and they drove me out to like the field. Which at that point, and it was like nighttime at this point. Um, I at that point, so they drove me out to like my group um, that I was going to be with, and I I remember then I was like, okay, I need to figure out where this car is going so I can like run. So mm -hmm. I was really desperately sort of trying to pay attention to like, like how long we drove to, to like where we turned, what was happening. And then like, it was so winding and off on these like crazy back roads and stuff that like, I couldn't, like, I couldn't keep track. Right. Um, and like, mind it, like, yeah, it's, it's, you know, February and like the mountains of Utah. So it is like freezing cold mm -hmm. outside. And mm -hmm. there are, um, I had probably about like three, four feet of snow, I'd say like around. So it's like, I mean, it is cold and very, very snowy. Um, so they dropped me off at the base camp or not the base camp, sorry, the like out in the field, like where um, the camp is for like my group that night. And I distinctly remember this because it was at the top of like, I'm not sure how steep the hill was like actually, but it, I remember it as being like impossibly steep. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and they um like pull my like backpack out of like the the car and they tell me I have to pick it up and this backpack is full of like you know I wasn't I wasn't like I wasn't that strong at that point okay um, I wasn't that fit and like I couldn't I really struggled to lift this backpack up like I I really couldn't do it and they just like they were just standing there and watching me like try to struggle lift this up and like um I think I weighed it like later because I was curious like how much it weighed like after I got out and I it was like I think like 50 60 pounds of like how heavy this was and this backpack when you say that you, they told you to pick up your backpack is it one that they've issued to you with all the stuff that yeah it's while one that they've, yeah it's one it had like I mean everything that like it was just like everything that like that was my stuff that was my belongings then Right. Um, so this is starting to sound very much like um, an, an interview I did with a, 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 a US veteran where she spoke about basic training in the army. Mm -hmm. Where you're expected to carry um, significant weight on your back for a very long amount of time. And if you yeah, put the funny. backpack down, you then there would sometimes you'd have to start again or your timer would be reset or you'd go back to the start of the trail or or or, or whichever it was that 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 you were expected to carry around this 
this bag. So you're being told mm-hmm. to take your backpack out of the car, which is too heavy for you to carry. Mm-hmm. And you're doing this unassisted and, and they're just standing there watching. Yeah, they're just standing there watching. Um, okay, okay. Like I, there's there's no even advice on like how best to try to pick it up or anything right. like that. I do understand um, that some wilderness programs are about trying to promote independence. But like you've just said, they're standing quietly watching you without offering you even any verbal assistance is not that's not promoting your independence in carrying that backpack on your own it's just standing there to watch you struggle yeah I think that's exactly what it was um Mm. so then yeah the camp is at like the top of like a hill and um I remember like trying like I finally by some somehow I managed to get the bag on and um I managed to get the bag on my back and then, um, then I had to like hike up this hill that's covered in a ton, like first a ton of snow. And it's actually, it's like really steep. And it was the snow. I, I, I remember this like distinctly is that the snow had like kind of frozen on the top. So you could, you were walking on the top of it, but then like, I remember taking like one step and then sinking in and then like rolling down the hill again. Right because I was thrown off. And so then, and that happened like a couple of times, like I kept falling and rolling back down the hill and having to figure out how to stand back up with this heavy backpack on before I could get to the top of the hill. And again, like no, even like helping me up, nothing like that. It was just kind of like, get up, keep going. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, and then, so I, again, like I finally made it to the top of the hill. Um, and I was then like passed off to my group and, um, there's like a phase system at this, which is pretty common in like all of these programs. Um, there's a phase system at uh, this wilderness at Second Nature as well, the wilderness program. And um, the first phase, uh, like you couldn't speak to anybody. So I was alone. I couldn't speak to the rest of the people in the group. So what, what? yeah, I remember then they were like, <laughs> told me that like, there's no speaking to anybody. So I was just, like sitting there, I could speak to the other staff members, but I couldn't speak to any of the people in the group. <laughs> right. Um, and that was until I think like, I can't remember, like, I think it was until like you, I can't remember like what the criteria was. I don't think it was for that long. I think I had to, like, I think it was until I like wrote my life story basically. And then I had to read that to the group and then I could join the group or something. Um. But so the first night I got up there and then I had like my own little fire alone and um, they had already like eaten dinner and all of that. So I didn't have get anything to eat that evening. Okay. And I, I just, I remember that. And then, so like, they kind of just like marched me um, back to like where the shelters were set up. And I say like shelters because they weren't tents. It was just a tarp. You had a, t- like you slept under a tarp that was, strung between like two trees and then on the ground you have like like you know a really thin sort of styrofoam sleeping mat just it wasn't for comfort it was to make sure you didn't actually freeze mm-hmm. um and that was it that was what you slept under on an uh, empty stomach in the middle of nowhere you don't know where you are you're not allowed to speak to anybody you've been subjected to a cavity search and yeah and i had to contact set it up in your the dark. parents <laughs> But you have to set it up yourself, carry your backpack yeah. to get there. And, and now you're basically being cast out into the cold on top of, of everything else. Yeah. And they take your boots at night so you don't run away. Right. So that's the end. Yeah. So that, that was the first day there. And like, I remember it, like, I remember it like it was yesterday. Like, I, like, I distinctly remember like the feeling of that and like laying there and being like, just like feeling like, I can't even like describe it, but it was like the feeling of it being like, like, where am I? Um, basically, and like, what is this? And I guess like, I remember this feeling that like my parents can't have known like what this was like. And so do you, do you remember the first time you were able to speak to them whilst you were in the program? Um, so actually speak with them. Mm-hmm. Um, they, I. Uh, maybe 10 or 11 maybe like maybe I mean like nine or ten weeks in whoa I thought you were gonna say yeah, days. You could, no no, no you, I didn't speak you don't speak with them 
like everything was through, um, you could write letters. So there was a therapist assigned to the group. Um, like, I, I'm not sure, like I would have thought that wilderness therapy, there would have been a therapist there like all the time. Um, but there's a therapist assigned to the group and she would come once a week and have sessions um, right. with people and then leave. And so we were just at the mercy of like staff members uh, at that point. And then like, honestly, like now thinking about it, they probably, the staff members I think would probably have like just graduated like university and were probably only like, I don't know, 22, 23 years old. Um, and like running like our therapeutic groups and stuff. Um, and I say that just sort of like a therapeutic group. Like, I mean, they weren't really necessarily qualified to be running therapeutic groups. And like, they te- were basically just like attack sessions on other people too. Mm-hmm. Um, that That's, I mean, the constant of like all of the therapy that's involved in this is mostly just sort of like the idea of like, you know, breaking someone down to build them back up, except they forget the second half of that. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we could write a letter to our, we could write letters to our parents. We weren't allowed to contact anybody else. Um, but we could write letters to our parents. Um, and then you would give them to your therapist. Uh, and then like, they were open. You didn't seal them. They were like, just, I had to write. Cause I, all I had was a notebook paper. I didn't have anything else. Um, and so you, they were like, open notebook paper, but I had no envelope to put it in. So like she would read them. Like, I think then they would like scan them and upload them online. So like, there was nothing, like you couldn't actually say anything either. Um, cause I, I'm fairly certain that if I would have been like, this place is terrible and all of this would happen. I didn't try that. Um, but it probably would never have gotten to them anyway, right. or I would have gotten in trouble too as well for saying that. Okay. Um, so that was the contact. And then, um, at one point, I think that they were trying to um, like incorporate, like some parents would come into the field, but that was only after, like I said, like weeks had happened, they would have like a parent therapy session. And my parents did come. Um, I think I had been there for about 10 weeks when they came. Um, and so, yeah, I wasn't there. I was there for longer than six weeks, basically. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. So you you get to this, you get to this program, you're in the cold, you're, you're given this basically like tarp to set up in the dark mm-hmm. and you think, okay, I'm going to be here for six weeks. What then happens when you wake up and then how do you integrate into the program? And what does the average day and week look like inside this program? Yeah. So, um, the average day, I remember like they would wake us up just by like kind of like yelling it was time to wake up um, because everybody had like their separate shelters but they were all like close to each other. Um, and then normally you would, you would hike most days. I actually ended up kind of like looking up on the, um, on the website uh, like to see how they like described things um, now about it. And it said that it is low impact hiking three to five days per week. Um, that's like bullshit. I'm sorry, can I, I'm not sure if I can curse on here. Yeah, but you, um, can, you can tell your story however you'd like to. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it was not low impact. It was, um, but so like, I think they said it was like, you know, a couple miles that you would go. Um, like I think it said like one to three miles or something. And um, I have no idea how long we did hike, but it was all day. It was really strenuous uphill. It was through blizzards. It was through rainstorms. Oh I was there from like February to May. So I experienced like a number of seasons, like winter into spring and then kind of into summer. Um, and uh, it, it was not like low impact. And then I remember the first like hike that we did, um, like, I was exhausted because again, you have this big backpack on your back as well. And um, I remember at the end, like I asked one of the staff members like, oh, how far did we go? Cause I just wanted to know. And he's like, well, as the crow flies, I'm like, no, how far did I walk? And then you don't get to know that. They'd be like, why, why do you need to know? And it'd be the same thing as like, what time is it? Why? Like, so I didn't get to know what time it was. I kept track of the days. What, what, um, what is the, what, what is- It's just supposed to be in the moment. 
Right. Okay. I was going to say, what do what do they gain by keeping this information from you? Like things, things like what is the time? I mean, control, but you're supposed to be in the moment. Okay. So it doesn't matter what time it is. It doesn't matter if it's three o'clock in the morning or, or whatever. Yeah. So, okay. um, yeah. So like, I remember that, like, I was trying to like, keep track of the days that like, and I, I don't think I wasn't the only one to do this. I like drew calendars. Cause like, I knew what day I was sent away and I knew that. And so like, I actually okay. had like, calendars drawn, um, in like my notebook just to sort of like check off. And then, so like I had like, and I think it's what got me through like the first six weeks is that like, I was still determined that I was going to be out of there in six weeks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, And so like, it was kind of like, all right, it's only six weeks. I can do this. I can do this for six weeks. I can do this for six weeks. And like, it was just me sort of like checking off like every day that I'd like drawn in like my notebook. Um, I, uh, but then like, besides that, like um, then there would be, you would hike most of the day and then um, you would like cook dinner over a fire, but you only got to eat like hot food if you could make a flame, um, which is like with um, the the vernacular for it there. I don't even know if this is what's used, but like what you called it there was busting. It's a bow drill. So it's like primitive fire making, um, basically like a little bit more advanced than rubbing two sticks together. Okay. Um, and like that was, um, the activity but like that's what you had to do you had to make fire okay um, and there was like so much therapeutic like significance tied to like your ability to make a fire um so much that if you didn't weren't able to do that you couldn't eat hot food if you didn't like bust a flame um, right so, so you would it would be like you're eating hungry. dehydrated beans and rice that okay. kind of thing is what you were eating like like all dry or like um like dry, just dried oats and things like that. Or like, um, yeah, basically that's what you're eating or dried ramen, like ramen noodle Gosh. packets, but not like cooked. Um, okay. If you didn't do that and like, you can't, it's hard. Like you, it's not easy to do. Okay. Um, so that was, um, like basically what you would do, you would have time for that after you hiked and then they would probably do some sort of therapeutic group. Um, normally it would just turn into like I can't even remember like what they would be about like honestly at this point because like I mean no, there was no way any of the people who were running that like the staff were qualified to be running like a therapeutic group um like there's just there's just no way but um yeah and then the days that the therapist would come we wouldn't hike because she would be there all day so that was a little bit like of like a a break you know relief yeah yeah, yeah yeah but then she would run a group and then that is when things would get like really bad and it would turn into like um you know you would try to get you to like confess to things and like mm. say that they never believe you are telling the truth and like you know I remember like when I had to write that like life story or whatever like I remember getting um like ripped to shreds effectively by the group when it because you had to read it aloud to the group and then that one, cause like I wasn't, and I had no idea, like, this is the first time I didn't know like what was expected of me through this. Cause no one gave me any guidance. I was like told like, write your life story. <laughs> like, what do you do with that? Um, and like, I was like, I wasn't being honest or like all of that in there. Like I left things out or I wasn't, you know, like using the, ther like getting, I didn't, ha I hadn't figured out the therapeutic, like I hadn't figured out exactly what I was supposed to say to be able to get ahead. Okay. Um, which is basically like what it is like, you know, like eventually like you kind of adapt, adopt like the language that you're supposed to be using. Okay. Um, and then, so like, I remember reading that. And so then it turns into that, which they call feedback. That's like a thing. It's like, so like, you know, you have to like, you're open to feed feedback and you have to be open to feedback. And then if you can't take it, they're just giving you feedback. Um, so and then I remember that there was like another group where the first letters that you would get from your parents are something called impact letters. Okay. Um, and these were basically your parents sitting down and writing like what I remember and like what is like everything that they don't like about you and like everything that like prompted them to send you away. What? Seriously? The first contact you've had with your parents after this, mm -hmm. all of this trauma... That and you don't get to read that in private either. You had to read it like the first time no, oh you, I would goodness. read it would be sitting in front of the group, like reading it aloud. 
that yeah is, that is oh awful so yeah it was um it wasn't like yeah I mean it was yeah I don't even really know like what to say about it like it was um hard like to have um, absolutely that and then like it's actually kind of infuriating is that I ended up um I said like I had I got my records from this program and I ended up like reading like finding like the therapy notes from um the therapist at that point of the time mark where I read those impact letters and like she wrote down she's like she was trying to read ahead without like reading in front of the group like you know trying to read ahead like quietly before I would say it Mm -hmm. like read it out Mm -hmm. loud like that was like a horrible thing I could have done and it's kind of like I mean it was like you know so immensely private like it's one thing even to read things like that like if you sort of like think about like your parents like and you know like they're the way I sort of felt and the way I kind of feel sometimes too is like you know like I know they didn't like me that much but like if they send you a letter with all the things that they were like upset at you about like it's one thing to read it privately and how that would feel but imagine like reading it and then knowing Mm -hmm. that like after you read it aloud that you are just going to be like torn apart like by the people there too about like what like a terrible person you are that is I can't oh that must have been so so difficult I mean yeah how many when when you say you had to read it in the group how many people were often in these therapy sessions with you so I think sessions I struggled to kind of I think that it was like like eight to ten like around like of like girls who were so it was all girls so it was like eight like maybe like ten people like of the like people who were there like um, I don't know if we call each other like students or what like that wasn't a thing yeah was like school. residents like, participants so I don't yeah. yeah yeah I think the um, the word often differs from program to program I don't know if there was necessarily like a word um there but um so yeah there were like 10 people there and then um I think like three staff members plus the therapist that you have to read it in front of but you like you don't know these people either it's horrible and, I mean and, or you do but like I mean because they're your life that's all you that's the only contact you have yeah yeah oh well when you're allowed to speak to each other yeah when you're allowed to speak to each other so you yeah you when you what are the sleeping arrangements like how many are, are, are of them are, are, are you like it, a certain amount of people in a room together or in a under the top together no, so everybody had their own shelter because they didn't want people, if you couldn't speak to someone outside of staff earshot. Um, right. So like, cause you could be like, you know, you could be plotting to run or something. Um, okay. Or what they would call war storying, which would be like talking about like things that weren't therapeutic or like talking about like, you know, your past life, right. that kind of okay. thing. So they'd be yeah. like, oh, that's a war story. Yeah. That is, um, so like, that's something that I, uh, that um they they didn't they you were not allowed to talk with like people outside of your shot and if you right. got caught trying to do that then that was like I don't, I don't really remember what would have happened but like you weren't allowed to do that so each person had an individual shelter which were you had to get it approved like spaced apart enough and then um like I said like they took away your boots at night so like you weren't gonna go like walking to someone else's shelter either because like you can't walk barefoot through the snow okay um, So like you couldn't speak of that. So, and then I think that if you were um, what was considered like a run risk or a self-harm risk or like on suicide watch or something like that, then you were sleeping under the staff tarp, like in between um, staff members. Oh my Um, That never happened to me. Yeah. And that's the same thing. If you're on that, then like you do not get a single moment of privacy. Like if you're like doing anything, like someone's watching you. Um. So, yeah, so that was the sleeping arrangements there. And you think you're going to be in this program for six weeks. What happens for you to end up being in the program for longer? And how long do you eventually stay? So I was there eventually for like 14 weeks. Um, oh, my goodness. And I, I actually reckon that I would have been there um longer still I actually was like meant to be but like because um the therapist that I had like didn't want me to go and my parents ended up like wanting me out because I actually think that at that point 
think the reason I was there for longer is that my therapist didn't like me and she and my dad clashed. My dad has a very abrasive personality and like tries to control everything. Right. Um, and I think that like she, he, I don't really know exactly what happened, but I think that the therapist and my dad clashed um, pretty significantly over certain things. And um, I think that my dad kind of realized that they may have just been trying to like squeeze them out of some money. Okay. Yeah. Um, so they, I think pulled me from the program. I wasn't like really, I figured that one out like later, but um, I think that at the time too, I had turned, um, so I was a little bit older than some other people there, which was a little bit like kind of like a saving grace on my end because it's like okay it's not that long I turned 17 while I was there in wilderness and I remember just sort of like sitting at like one point this wasn't long before I was like leaving um that I was kind of like it felt like I'd been there because um I had been there the longest and people who had come after me were leaving and everything so I was just there it felt like I was there for ages I remember like having this sort of like clarity like in me being like, okay, this is my life now. I'm just going to be here. And then if I turn 18, then I'll leave. Was there a reason that, I mean, what, what reasons were they given for you to stay there? You said that you were biased. Did you, did you end up just kind of going against, going against their rules at some point? I don't think I was as like, I hadn't like, I didn't open up. I wasn't as like therapeutically open, I think was the problem. Like I hadn't come to the point where I was like, I think like make like, I didn't feel like I had that much like crazy things to like confess to basically. Cause I didn't, I would have had to start like making things up. Um, right. And um, at that point, like as well, I think to keep me there, they sort of invented that I was like a drug and alcohol, like alcohol, I was an alcoholic and a drug addict. Um, so like, because like, I said like the original reason like why I was sent away was because I wasn't like going to school um but they had to keep me there for something more so okay they sort of took the fact that like I had you know I was drinking with friends and I'd smoked weed a handful of times um and I was smoking cigarettes or that kind of thing that um that made me a drug addict and alcoholic my dad is also at that time was um, less than a year into being a recovering alcoholic and like growing up had been a pretty bad alcoholic okay um, my whole life and so like at that point too like the other thing is that like, my dad was pretty gung-ho about these like therapeutic programs because he'd just gotten sober and like he felt like his whole life was different and he was just starting right. to try to be a parent okay um, yeah yeah so he had this almost confirmation bias of of going through a program himself and being being sober yeah. for a year and feeling as if anybody that goes through a program like the one he's been through, it, it will help them with whatever they're struggling with. Yeah. And he's also like ex-military. So I think there's like the um, like structure on that. End right. I did that, like... wonder, I did wonder. Yeah. I, think that, I think that's what I was thinking at the start of the episode when I asked if your parents were um themselves involved in further education because a lot of the time I think you can uh, uh, there's a lot of pressure put on children and teenagers whose parents are maybe lecturers themselves or Mm -hmm. or have a lot of accreditation to, to and qualifications to their name to go on to do really well in education so when you said that your parents didn't feel like you were achieving academically how they wanted you to I wondered if that was the case but now you've talked about your father being regimented that that kind of that answers that question in my mind for me in the same way yeah 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 I I think I think it's a major detail I messed out on (laughs) I, I, I that must be yeah I mean a lot of the time if there are too many boundaries in place it is very often that you will see teenagers kick back against that and that sounds like that could have been what happened here with you yeah I think I think that happened I think that like I um like I so, like my dad was kind of absent and like drunk for a good portion of my childhood and my mom I don't think was like really that interested in dealing with like a teenager um, right. and then she would kind of just leave and stuff and um 
once I think that like my brother who didn't really do all that well in school, but like just did what he was supposed to do. And then like went to a university and like, once he like left the house and everything, like they were still kind of stuck with me. Um, I think that that was kind of like, what, what do we do now? Because like, I also think that like, I kind of, um, I think like called attention to like the problems in the family. Whereas like my family is very good at pretending like right, everything's yeah, great and nothing yeah. bad's ever happened. And like, even now, like, I don't think like they pretend that this didn't happen. I don't think that even if they maybe think they made a mistake, I still think that they think I deserved what I got there. Even if they didn't particularly like the programs or the people who ran them, um, that I probably deserved it. And uh, it's not discussed and they were great parents. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. yeah and I and, and potentially there, there, there could potentially be the situation there that once your brother has left home then there is more time to focus on you or or because you're the only child left in the house it means that mm-hmm. automatically the attention falls onto you and then your parents are they're like oh uh hang on a minute Maggie is kind of not doing what 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 we would hope she would be doing um yeah I think that's exactly like what it was like more more or less they I mean I was never doing what they like wanted me to do but um I think that like when the attention was like solely on me that became a problem for them and so you mentioned before that if you stayed out of trouble you you wouldn't have to worry about any of the discipline in the in the sessions and and what what kind of things might get you into trouble in this program like in the therapy sessions out of the therapy sessions you said that you you can't speak with unless you're in earshot of staff members so I'm guessing that could potentially be one thing that might get you into trouble that would get you into trouble um I think that like on my end it felt like like I remember like being there like it was like anything I ever did was gonna try to like like was something wrong it felt like like um like I can be pretty sarcastic if I'm like talking and it was always taken the wrong way like like quite literally everything that I would say okay. um so I think that like I that developed like a uh, like reputation early on of being like arrogant and like mean um and so like anything that I would say, they'd be like, well, Maggie, you can't be sarcastic. And then it felt like at that point, like I just like wasn't allowed to like have a sense of humor or like be myself. Um, and I still kind of feel that way. It's like, if I want allowed to like, sort of like, you know, have some like sarcastic jokes, like, you know, that kind of thing. Like, it feels like, that's not like, that's not who, like, it, it feels like it's part of me missing if, if you know what I mean. Um, so a lot of that would be like, um, they, I think they just thought like, so yeah, on that end, like, and then like, I kind of push back against it because it's like really hard to like, to, like stop being someone that like I've been. And so like, I would, if I just like, wasn't thinking and I would make a joke or whatever, then I would have to explain myself that like, no, I was joking, but then everybody would have taken it literally. And, um, that would have gotten me in trouble. Um, I think that like not being receptive to feedback, whatever that was, which was normally about like how I had acted, um, that would have gotten me in trouble. Um, I also had like I think they thought I was like really arrogant and I probably was like if I'm gonna be honest like I um I think the other reason like going on about like why um my family thought that like I should have been doing better in school or like like cared more about it and everything was that I was in like you know like gifted programs and things like that like I, I was like a a like gifted student I just wasn't like a high achieving one if that one makes if that makes sense that like I think I had the potential that I wasn't living up to but um, when I was 16, I think I did have a little bit of arrogance about my intelligence and I'll give it, I'll give that little bit about it. Um, and so like, I don't think that I really shied away by thinking of like, like letting people know that I thought I was smarter than them when I was there. Right. And when you say that certain things would land you in trouble, what would be the discipline that came with, with those, with those actions? normally it was just sort of like verbal abuse basically um I can't remember like it would be like like feedback it was what they always called it but it was basically like people telling you um like phrased in a the therapeutic way 
which I can't remember, but like phrased in a way that it was meant to be like constructive, but like basically people telling you that they hated you and like that you were like a bad, like a bad person and all of those kind of things. So like that would be the major thing. And then um, at one point, um, and I actually can't remember like what I did to like get myself, um, to get myself like into this situation. Like, I don't know what triggered it, but they put me on what they call was busting focus, um, which was basically, I was supposed to spend all of my spare time um, trying to bow drill flames. Like, you know, the same, like I told you. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, thing. yeah. Um, and they, the, the, my therapist pulled me away from the group. Um, this is after I'd been there for like a number of weeks. Um, and I was not allowed to speak with the group, um, for, I think it was like five or six weeks, um, that I wasn't allowed to talk to anybody like kind of to staff. When we went on hikes, they had to make sure that there was like a good, um, I don't know, 20 feet or something of like space in between me and anybody else. So I wouldn't like secretly talk to anybody and, um, I had my own little like area, my own little fire, my own like everything. And I had to spend like all of my time like that I wasn't hiking or whatever, like busting flames, like basically. And so much that I spent so much time on that. I ended up like developing tendonitis in my lip, in my oh wrist. Oh my goodness. That um, they did have like a, like they noticed that. And like, I couldn't actually like press down the way I was supposed to, like I couldn't do it. So then I was put on that. I they were told, okay, well, I wasn't allowed to keep, busting. So I was like, okay, cool. They're going to take me off of this busting focus. But then I was told I needed to, at that point, then bust emotional flames with no context, um, as to what that was, uh, like, or like how I was supposed to do that. So it was just like a way to sort of keep me, um, a way to sort of like keep me, uh, away from the group. I don't really know why. Okay. Um, and it was a number of weeks. If they, if they thought of you as non-compliant with all of the kind of therapy would you be then targeted more so in the group therapy sessions where everybody would be targeting each other yeah and I honestly at that point like in wilderness like I think that like I was more of like I was an easy target because I wasn't liked um there like I did like they knew that like the therapist didn't particularly like me um and I, uh, that like, it was like a bit of an easy target because I was always like, it didn't matter like what I did, like I'd done something wrong. A word from today's sponsor, Samuel Knox and his new book, How to See a Man About a Dog. From the author Samuel himself, quote, this is a collection of poetry, prose and ramblings. Please read at your own discretion. How to See a Man About a Dog is a collection of experimental short stories, powerful poems and pulp fiction prose that will take you on a wild, hilarious and heartbreaking journey. Surrealist short stories, memoiristic poems and haunting jokes guide you through the wild imagination of emerging writer Samuel Knox's mind. Samuel's work is a kaleidoscope collage made of equal parts delight and despair. Internationally selling author Knox blends sci-fi, horror, fantasy and non-fiction into a single enrapturing vision of what it means to be human in the modern age. His work is available today with raving reviews wherever you find your books or follow the link in the episode description to get your copy today. How to See a Man About a Dog by Samuel Knox. Can you give us an example of one of these therapy sessions? You know, it's like, it's so hard for me to like, think of like specifics about like, like what actually happened. Does it feel Um, like it kind of all blended into just one, one thing? Yeah. Like, honestly, it's only been like somewhat recently where I like a lot of these memories have even like really come back. Um, Like it all, like I've blocked out like so much of it. Like I do remember like, like some things, but like actually like kind of like remembering like what people like have have said like or like said to me or all of that was like 
Yeah, it's just like it's hard to really like remember like everything that kind of happened. Um, I think yeah, I think that is quite common with some of the people that that I speak to on this show. Uh, often say that kind of their experiences seem to kind of all blend together, or the therapy sessions were so similar because people would run out of stuff to admit to or or lie about that mm-hmm. they that they did. You know, would say that their drug habits were far worse than they actually were or the drugs that they'd taken were were absolutely nothing like things that they had actually tried um yeah and people would admit to things that they hadn't done just so the spotlight would would move from them to somebody else just so that their turn to talk about things and you know kind of air quotes work through things so that actually did end up like now that we're talking on this that like like um like specifically, because like I I think I mentioned like and I touched on like like they needed something more to like really like keep me there than just like me being like like not liking school, like me like skipping school or whatever. Like that wasn't really like enough to like keep the motivation. So like really leaned into like the like drug and alcohol thing. And right. um so I think that like I mean, like I definitely did, and there also like just to like for that, it's like there also like I had a lot of social anxiety too. And, um, like I wanted to kind of seem cooler to, um, the people there, like the people there too. So like, I think that there was like a thing is like this, look at me ahead. If I said that, like, I, you know, drank more or did like harder drugs than I have done all of these things, Mm -hmm. um, or like more frequently, I can't even, I actually think at that point, I don't think I admitted to like using like hard drugs or anything, but I think it was like, I tried to say like, it was constant. Or like I was like more often drunk than I was sober or something like that. Um, because like that would like get you in some way, like get you ahead. Um, like big revelations like that were like good. Um, and even then it even was if this, they were things that never happened. Even if they were things that never happened, it was the same sort of thing that like, like I was a virgin when I went there but mm-hmm. like that wasn't believed. And then eventually I just sort of like made up that I wasn't. And like, then like that was actually better that I hadn't because then I could have just been some person who also had a problem with like sexual promiscuity or whatever, even though like I didn't, that wasn't an issue of mine. Right. So or whatever, yeah, if it's an yeah. issue for anybody, like that's not like, for, like, pe- like, you know what I mean? But like, things that they wanted to like brand me as like, I mean, like as someone who hadn't had sex, I was like, okay, yes, I've had sex with all of these people now. Um, and then like, then they're like, okay, well, here's another issue with her. Um, so like that, that does happen. Like, and it did happen. And then it comes to the point that like, um, you have like, th- sometimes there just like aren't enough things like, you know, that you get pressured enough or like, you feel like, you know, this will actually like be better if I just come up with something to like get myself out of this so you're there for eight for 14 weeks and then yeah your dad kind of catches on to what he thinks might be happening there financially with them kind of making up reasons why you need to stay so so how are you how do you do you go home after these 14 weeks are you picked up and taken home or or what happens next so no one goes home like I don't think anybody that I was in like this group was went at home after this. That's not like what happens. There's a pipeline. Um, like a, uh, so everybody like pretty much goes through like the wilderness program, then afterwards goes to a therapeutic working school or like a residential treatment center afterwards. Um, I believe that the therapist of there probably gets some commission for referring to certain schools. I'm in programs. Um, I think that like another reason like my therapist didn't like pick up or like like my parents is that like they found a school that they wanted me to go to and like it wasn't like in I don't think that like my the therapist at the um wilderness program had a connection with them so I don't think she was getting any money and didn't want me to go there either um but she also like had a thing I think she was trying to play on my family too that like I needed to be there or like they like to have like a life and death situation like to keep you there too like if you don't stay if you don't keep your daughter here if she doesn't stay here then like she will be like yeah you know shooting heroin in a ditch in like six weeks time or something Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like um so after I'd been there like I 
like they had me like graduate the program properly, um, whatever that means. And my parents picked me up um, in Utah um, and we drove, this is how I knew how long it was driving because we spent the night somewhere and then drove down to um, the therapeutic boarding school I went to, Spring Ridge Academy, SRA right. is what yeah. I call it. Yeah. And so, yeah. <laughs> It's and I hadn't all- taken a shower that entire time. I actually distinctly remember like the shower that I had when I left, I spent like an hour in that shower. The water was like running black because I was so dirty. What you did, hang on, <laughs> wait, you didn't have a shower the entire time you were at the second no. nature wilderness program. No. So you spent 16, you, could- you spent like 14 weeks with no, no shower. No shower. Yeah. How did you wash yourself? You would have like a large can of water that you could like heat up and then just sort of like, you know, like spot bath, like yourself, basically. Oh my goodness. So, oh, so it just feels like, oh, I know that you're out in the wilderness and, and, you know, I've taken children on, on scout weekends and residentials and things like this but they've been like two to five days yeah I've been to like weekend long festivals four day long festivals and it feels like I haven't showered for a year so I cannot even imagine how it must feel to not be able to wash properly for 14 weeks in an environment that is supposed to be healing and therapeutic Yeah. I mean, I think that like, that was like the thing that like people always discussed about like, you know, like when you leave, like they let you have a shower and it was like this thing that like you were working toward was the shower. It just Um, feels like so much. I know that a lot of it must be around taking away creature comforts like technology. And, um, you know, if you are drinking alcohol or smoking cigarettes or taking drugs or whatever it is that that Mm -hmm. you're trying to work through in these programs again in 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 kind of air quotes um Mm -hmm. it there's so much of your basic human rights that you've had taken away during your time in this program you know from the beginning with the cavity search and then kind of not being fed properly and then going through these long repetitive air quotes therapy sessions where you are not working through any type of mental health problems or addiction problems because you're being told that you are an addict when you're not or you're being told Mm -hmm. that you have that you need to admit to countless sexual relationships that you've had that you haven't. Mm -hmm. You're not even being allowed to wash properly, which is, which is like a basic human right for us, you know, especially because we're lucky enough to live in the Western world where we have access to clean water and things Mm -hmm. like a running tap. And you're, you're spending 14 weeks in this program where you're supposed to be healing yourself, not even allowed to clean yourself properly. And then you've gone straight to another program, which in my mind is like when you go on holiday for a week and you're so like, you, you don't spend any time like relaxing. And then it's like, you mm-hmm. get back and you go straight back to work. Straight and to you, work. Need, you need a holiday to get over your holiday. It's like, you've gone from one program that's been so traumatic and horrible and lonely and isolating and cold and miserable and dirty because you can't wash and hungry because you can't eat straight into Mm -hmm. another program where you're probably going to have to not only work on the stuff that you were supposed to work in on the first program but then work on the stuff that happened to you in the first program yeah and where you're not actually yeah yeah I mean yeah that's pretty much it (laughs) I just can't even wrap my mind around it it's it's it just it just seems like rubbing salt in the wound going from straight from one program to another and and i understand that your father probably needed to feel like he had c- control over the situation not That's only it, from yeah. from his regimented time in the forces but also 
on trying to maybe trying to control his addictions he feels like he must be in control of everything that he can control so that he keeps that level of control over the things that that he can so that you know because I imagine with severe addiction you feel like you're not in control so as soon as you regain any element of that it's like total control over everything is needed at all times so you go from one program to another and and choosing which program that is going to be and how long you're going to stay there you know I, maybe this all feeds into it and and I'm just I'm sure if there's a one or two people studying psychology that are listening, they'll kind of be saying I'm either right or completely wrong. So, <laughs> uh, either way, it to me it just seems so heartbreaking that you've that you're picked up and just taken to just to another program. I, I yeah, I, it's just a lot, isn't it? Yeah, and like I'm not even like. Like just to like, I mean, like not trying to minimize my own experiences on this either, but like, I actually think like my experiences aren't even as bad as some people, like, um, a lot of people like who will have gone to wilderness, like, you know, like my parents took me and like, I was compliant and everything. Like some people get, you know, transported, yeah, which is like, yeah. you know, getting kidnapped in the middle of the night by like hired goons. Um, we actually had like where we called it like getting gooned like at school like it was a thing is like who like that was people who got gooned or who like were like parents dropped them off yeah basically. well this is why I asked the question about airport security because mm-hmm. there there may be there may be some teenagers and young adults who have been taken against their will in the middle of the night who might be dropped off at the airport by these goons and then greeted by program staff and airport security on the other side mm-hmm. and often these these people that have been taken in the night are handcuffed or mm-hmm. no they are zip tied um mm-hmm. so it just it, it it just when you mentioned airport security being there that's that's what came to, to the forefront of my mind you know these these horrible yeah. situations where these people are removed from their houses completely against their will in the middle of the night yeah I yeah so like that didn't happen to me thankfully and um the same thing is that like my parents picked me up and drove me down to like my other program instead of like sometimes like people were also like the same people who like kidnapped them the first time also transport them to their second program so like thankfully none of that happens like and like I think that you know all kind of traumas like relative or whatever but like there are some people who've had like even worse things happen like in the context of this and what just remind everybody is spring ridge you said in arizona is Mm -hmm. the name of the second program yeah spring ridge academy okay so your parents are taking you to this second program Mm -hmm. so what is it like when you see them and you have a reunion um, I don't know. Like, you know, I think that at that time, like, so I didn't know I was leaving like wilderness, the wilderness until like 30 minutes before the like van came to pick me oh up. Oh my goodness. Okay. Because like, that's the whole thing is like, I like, um, you know, you're not allowed to know anything because like, you're supposed to be in the moment. And like, I think that like, because I was so, like, keen on asking, like, what time it was when I first got there, that, like, particularly with me, I never knew when I was leaving. Um, okay. So, yeah, my, my parents picked me up. I think that, like, when, you know, I was still in shock, but, like, it felt like, I think that, like, at that point, like, I thought then that, like, not, like, I was just so grateful to be, like, out of the woods, literally, um, like there that like anything could be better, you know, a place where I could sleep in a bed and like have a regular shower and like, you know, just sort of like be like back and sort of civilized, like whatever you think, but like, you know, like not living under a tarp in the wilderness, like that kind of thing. So yeah, yeah. I think that like, and like, I'd known that I was going to be, I would kind of figured out like the that no one just went home after wilderness. I'd, I'd figured that one out like early on enough 
um, because I'd seen some people leave and they were all going to other programs. And like, I just, I, which they, at Wilderness, they call aftercare just as like a blanket term. Um, but, um, so I, I had kind of figured out that like, I knew that I was going to be going, I wasn't going home. Um, so, and then, um, at Spring Ridge, like when I found out that that was where I would be going after I left at whatever date, whatever date I left, I knew that I would be going to SRA. Um, I was actually somewhat comforted by it, um, because, in my group in wilderness, um, there was one girl whose identical twin sister had been sent to SRA. So I went to wilderness with one twin and then like the therapeutic boarding school with another twin. Right. So like, oh, okay. okay. So I know someone there. So it must have been weird being with this sister who wasn't the one that you'd actually spent all this time with. Yeah, because they look, I mean, like identical twins as well. So like <laughs> very strange. You're like, wow, I know you, but I don't actually know you at all. Yeah. So it was that was like kind of like, and I I yeah, that was kind of odd. But like it was like one of those things, like it felt like slightly familiar. Okay. Um, like going there. And it felt like a little bit better because like um the twin had like known that like her sister had was being sent away. She got sent away after. So like, she kind of told me the things that like, she'd already found out about SRA and like all of that. So like, it, it, it felt slightly familiar. And like, again, like at that point, it seemed like, like, it seemed like nothing could be, like it had to have been better than wilderness is like what I thought at the time leaving. So I think that like reuniting with like my parents and them driving me down, like it was kind of like, just like everything felt like, I felt so grateful to everything. like. I know it like it took me about like three or four showers for like the water to finally like run clear. Um, like, and I, uh, I don't know. I know like my mom dyed my hair back because I had like, like roots, like just like dark roots and then like, you know, brassy faded like hair mm-hmm. from, like, where yeah. it was like dyed. Um, so like there are certain things that kind of felt like normal that I think I was more like grateful for than like anything. And uh, I also think that I just sort of had this thing that like, I like, it's like I had turned 17, like not long before I'd left. And so I was like, okay, well anything, it's only gonna be a year. And like, that's another thing where I think I was fortunate in all these programs that it was a little bit better for me because like, regardless of what happened and like whatever tactics like SRA would try to pull, um, I did think I had that like out that like I would be 18 like soon and I could like leave if I needed to. Right. Okay. So what's your impression of this place when you, when you arrive here at this second program? Um, I think that like, it was hard to make a first impression like on that, like, so SR is like an all, it's like an all girls. Like, that's the thing is like, the other thing is that like my parents like would, especially after the revelations of like, you know, my like alleged, sexual promiscuity that yeah. um didn't exist but like I was only like ever going to be in like an all-female environment so it was like an all-girls school mm-hmm. um honestly like first getting there again like I had like like quite an open-minded like mentality like first there and like after like being there too like after spending so much time in wilderness I think that at that time too I had um kind of like I learned the lingo a bit and I'd kind of figured out like what I needed to say and stuff to make it seem like I was like to play the game that, which is all it was. Like I've kind of figured out how to play the game of the place. So I felt like relatively like, well, prepped for being there. Um, When I first like got there, I remember like them like going through, there was another strip search um, when you get in because like, obviously like, why not? Um, <laughs> I uh, to get in there um and then like I remember them like completely going through like inventorying like all of the things that like my mom had packed for me okay um again like we're all in uniform so there's no like personal clothes or anything like that and the same thing at SRA is there's a phase system um the phases mean a lot at SRA like um you have to get through all their four phases. You have to you start at phase one and at phase four, you have to get through all four phases in order to graduate. Um, right, okay. And you can also be dropped phases. Right. Um, 
too. So like the phase system was, and this is like the lower phases, phase ones and twos like are like terrible. Like you don't want to be on them. Um, you have a lot more rules involved. So like, I think that initially, like when I first arrived there, you're assigned a big sister and, um, my big sister, uh, at the time, like she was, uh, someone who had like, I mean, I don't know what she's like now. So she's like, I think, you know, everybody there kind of did what they needed to do to survive in that place. So like, I don't really fault anybody for like the way they acted while they were at SRA. Like everybody had to do what they needed to do there. Um, however, she, I think found the best way for her to be there was to be like the biggest stickler for the rules ever. Right. And, okay, um, yeah, yeah. was like, I mean, like, and I did not care for her like while we were there. Um, and like, she was like, so I just remember like her being there and like, like going through like every single rule that there was and like all of these things that just seemed like like ridiculous about like you can change here but you can't like you know even though no one can see you if you change here you can't change there because that's like not allowed or you have to if you're a phase one or two you have to ask if you want to leave your room um and then you have to ask if you want to go anywhere and then the staff will have to like you know talk on a walkie-talkie to be like maggie is coming over here and then like when then you'd walk over then the other staff member like when they saw you'd be like i see maggie that kind of thing and um uh that I couldn't talk to other I'm pretty sure I couldn't talk to other lower phases I definitely couldn't speak to other phase ones right so I can't remember so, if like when get in there because like, like a, a lot of us versus them going on then it was more so like I mean it was a way to sort of keep like you know before like you really like I think accepted the program was what they used but before I think you've been like conditioned enough to like know how to like be there they didn't want like lower phases like conspiring to run and things like that or like you know I, I think that that was the main thing and then like an upper phase like doesn't want to jeopardize their time like because they're like more cl they're closer to the end than they are they don't want to jeopardize getting dropped or getting in trouble or anything like that so they're not going to tolerate anybody else talking so there's immediately there was very much like a big brother vibe and that like you can't talk to anybody you have to be very careful who you trust and like yeah so th that was like the initial impressions there and um I think that like I mean there's there's so many things I could talk about like mm -hmm. that are just like absolutely bizarre about that place that um I can't even like remember it, but like just the rules on rules on rules, there'd be no way any sane person could remember all of them. And mm -hmm. like, any single person, no matter how much you try to follow all of them, you were going to break something. Like yeah, there's just, yeah. there was just no way. You were it's set up for failure. Absolutely designed, yeah, designed that way, yeah. And it's interesting because a lot of the troubled teen coverage that we've done on the show started with me talking about Synanon and then see you mm -hmm. adopting a lot of the Synanon dialogue uh terminology mm -hmm. structure um mm -hmm. and a lot of uh, you know the the staff and the people involved in setting up CDU kind of all seem to somehow link back to synanon and then a lot of these other programs seem to then adopt things that CDU were using or staff yeah. from from staff would would branch out to other programs or graduates of programs that came from CDU would then go on to work in these other programs so when you say yeah. things like brothers and sisters that to me goes <laughs> straight back to go straight back to CDU and I'm wondering if you know of any of the staff being affiliated with any of these other troubled teen programs or whether the staff were even qualified or trained in their roles um do you do you yeah. have any any light you can shine on on the in the in the people employed in this program? Yeah, so um, I do know. So the woman who ran the program, she called herself the CEO of the school, and I think it's like mostly because like I think she liked the idea of like saying that she was a female CEO. Right. Honestly, like one of those like it was more of like an ego thing. Like it seems weird to be a CEO of a school, but um that's like on there I uh, the woman who started and founded uh SRA Jeannie Courtney um had formerly worked in some way I'm not entirely sure like what it's kind of hazy 
um, for a program called Cross Creek, um, which I'm not sure if you've heard of that, but that was like a WASP program. And I'm not sure if you know about like, because I think WASP was like right, like kind of after CDU, but it's yeah, yeah. effectively the same. It's like was founded by a man called like, I've done a lot of like a man called like Robert Rich Litchfield, who I know like at that point also was like a major um, donor to uh, Mitt Romney, um, mm -hmm. who's a politician. Um, uh, anyway, that's another tangent that like, it, it, that kind of thing is like how much money is involved and how like politicians are in there is how these things like I think like are still running today. But um, so Jeannie, like I know worked for Cross Creek in some way. And then she was used to be married to a man called David Gilcrease, who um, used to facilitate LifeSpring seminars, which I'm not sure if you know about LifeSpring mm. at all, but they were like, you know, self-help seminars that were really popular in the 70s and 80s. Um, and then like, I think were quite cultish and preyed upon people for like money and stuff that like, you know, you needed to like pay to go to the next seminar, like yada, yada, yada. Right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's so many layers to this. So he had facilitated life spring seminars and then um, founded like a company called Resource Realizations that right. then held the seminars for the WASP programs. And okay. um, Jeannie, uh, the woman who ran SRA, like ended up an offshoot starting after I think she divorced this man, um, creating SRA and then tweaking these seminars just ever so slightly enough to like call them her own. And okay. that was like the basis of, um, that was the basis of like SRA's program were, um, which we called them trainings, the seminars. Uh, but if you actually do any like research into like the WASP programs, they're like pretty much exactly the same. Like they're not, I was always told and she always said that like made it seem like they were, like she had just dreamt them up and they were like completely unique. Right. Um, to her. And then like, it wasn't until recently that I realized like how many people went through very, very, very similar um, seminars with like really similar, similar exercises and stuff uh, involved too. So that's the connection there. <laughs> so there is a connection. I, I was just curious because I feel like the, this industry is very incestuous and I always try and oh, see yeah. if that holds true with each person that's had an experience in with, with this institutionalized abuse in America to see if that holds true and it uh, and it always seems to actually do exactly that. So you've just given us the answer to that question. Um, so I so did a lot of research into this. <laughs> like at one point, I think I went down like way too much of a rabbit hole of like trying to figure out like all of these links. I can't find a way of where like SRA directly like completely links to like CDU and Synanon, but there are so many similarities in there that like. It, I mean, like everything. And the other thing with like all these people who like work in these programs and stuff, like if one even gets like shut down, half the time they just like open something up else up new just under a different name. Yeah, which is also why I asked if second nature is still called second nature earlier on in yeah. the episode. Um, and it surprises me that they are, but does not surprise me that some of their facilities have closed down. And hopefully yeah. second nature will 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 follow in its brothers and sisters footsteps very soon but we'll uh, so. we, we can just keep our fingers crossed um so what was the daily routine like in in this in this spring ridge program yeah so um you woke up at about 5 five thirty. you woke up really early in the morning um and um immediately then you i think probably like 5 30 a.m um then you would do what we called PC, physical condition, conditioning, which was basically you would run around a track for an hour. Right. Um, and like, there was no real getting out of that either. Like they didn't really believe you if you were actually injured, they were probably just faking an injury, all of that. Um, so um, you did that for an hour and then like, breakfast which was always just like plain oats and you could with nothing in it but you could get one honey packet and put like a, like and it wasn't ever it was like, like two spoonfuls it was like never very much and um I like to this day cannot like eat like oats with like honey it like makes me gag <laughs> um just because it was like every single day mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. that um and then I know that we spent like a good amount of time cleaning 
um, in the morning, just cleaning our rooms, like doing everything. And then we had school, um, which was like proper school. Like we okay. had like teachers and stuff, which some like programs, it's like just like. Yeah. Things. Yeah. So qualified teachers. Yes. But the, like the caveat to that is like there were qualified teachers, but if you had like you were like slightly advanced or like, like, like didn't like were the only person who needed a certain like credit for something or other, like you were pretty much given what they called an independent study and had to sit there and just like, I had to do this for like a couple of like classes um, where like, I just had to like sit there and like, you know, like fill out, you know, like the like questions in a textbook basically. And so that was like my school. Um, so when you left this program, like you could leave with some some type of of accreditation towards your like GED and things like that yeah yeah you could leave with like I think that I think that they're so I I technically like graduated high school from this program but um I'm actually like like completely honest like don't think it's not like a real high school diploma um I think that they're probably like a credit like a credit I think they actually are accredited now um okay Look, I'm not sure, but like, I just remember like someone like, like uh, pointing out that like the diploma I have doesn't actually say diploma on it. It just basically says that like, I've completed what is required for the state of Arizona. Like it doesn't, like, it doesn't really say anything about like having graduate or anything like that on there. It hasn't held me back in life though. I haven't got like, yeah, it hasn't held me back in life. So right. good. That's, that's at least one thing we can say is kind of not better that's not I it's not the word, right word to use but at least it this is a it's a, an improvement a, a, a positive difference from the other programs that we've discussed on on the podcast um, yeah I do know like a number of people though who like left the program and just ended up getting GEDs instead right. of like actually finishing high school as well because like the academics that we had were not like good I kind of feel like with the, how many times I jumped around schools and everything that like, I stopped like, um, like actually like learning anything in school by the time, like I was in like, you know, maybe like 14 or something like in like eighth grade rather Mm -hmm. than, um, Mm -hmm. like anything that like, I I don't really feel like I learned anything. Right. Like, especially at SRA, like it was, um, kind of like a joke academically. Uh, but we did have school. Okay. Um, and like okay. how you behaved and how you did in school, um, your teachers were part of, um, to kind of like explain this one is that um, there were actual therapists on staff and everything. And there were a handful, I think five on staff and um, every therapist, um, like if the, the group of uh, students who had the same therapist, that was your caseload. And then each caseload um, had a treatment team. So it'd be like your therapist and two staff members, um, and, um, two teachers were like on it. So then they would all meet and like talk about you. So like everything was kind of like, they tried to build it as like this very holistic thing, but like your therapeutic growth was how like you behaved in the community, how you did it, like, which was like outside of like, like whatever. So that was the staff member spying on you basically. Um, how you behaved in like academically and then like how your progress was therapeutically um so and that was all like done with like a case like your caseload treatment team um so like we would have school um and I like we'd end and then we would have like more time where we had to exercise so we had an hour in the morning probably like an hour hour and a half in the afternoon where it would be like a sport of some sort or like running or some sort of like, they were very in on making us run and do a lot of physical exercise um, there. And then after that, we would have like a hour, hour and a half long, like uh, therapy group of some sort. Um, and sometimes that was what was called like caseload group, which was when you would meet with your caseload and mm-hmm. your, um, there'd be staff members and then there would be like your therapist. And that was, yeah, that was twice a week. And that was where you would see like afterwards, it'd be, it would be like this big thing. Like you knew which days so that would when be people would be like either um, moved up a phase or dropped a phase. Um, that was like when, like that was the drama. Like you knew that either you were going to be like effectively like attacked 
during that time about something that you've done wrong, something like that. And like everybody would go after you or you'd know that you'd been doing well and maybe that like you might've gotten moved up or you would be get, getting dropped. Like it was very dramatic right? and like very nerve wracking. Like mm-hmm. every, and you never knew. Like, I think sometimes you could get like later on would get like feelings about what was happening, but then sometimes like someone would just like zone, like zoom in on someone and they would just be like, um, you know, you, you, you like just, fo- they would just be like a focus on someone until like effectively, like the person would end up breaking down crying or like something else. And there would be like consequences happening or like all of that. And consequences could be anything, but like, they were never good. And they were a lot more harsh than they would have been. I think even like at like second nature, because it felt, things felt like more real, I suppose, like at a, at SRA. And what were the sleeping arrangements like in this, in this second program? Yeah. So we had, um, like a good, like dorm, um, rooms. Um, we lived with our caseload and there were like bunk beds, like four beds in a room. Um, yeah. So it was, and then, um, all the doors in the rooms, like we always had to have the door open. You couldn't close the door. Um, and there were staff there 24 seven. If you were on phase one or two, if you wanted to leave your room, I mentioned this, you had to ask to leave your room, even though the door was open or whatever, you'd have to like stand there and be like, can I come out? And then sometimes a staff member would like willingly ignore you or just say no, like that kind of thing, just for the hell of it, I think. Um, and, uh, at night, there was a night staff that came in. Um, they would never turn down the lights or anything and would talk very loudly all night long. Oh, so gosh, like, I'm okay. a very light sleeper. So like, you would just honestly hear people all the time, like constantly. And there were a lot of like rules about like what you were allowed to like, even like wear to bed. Because if you wore like, like say if like you were slept in like leggings or something that like could have been like, like, or like yoga pants or something like that, that like was comfortable, but like it could have been, you couldn't because that was a run risk. Like you had to wear like pajamas, but then you couldn't wear like a tank top. Um, Like I know people who got like, what was like in trouble and got like work hours or things from that, like sleeping in a tank top. So like crazy things like that. So that was our sleeping arrangements. And what about things like contact home it, it was it different to the to the first program or quite similar in, in in the way that it was few and far between and very monitored it was very monitored um so the main I think selling point that uh SRA like tried to do was that they were like very involved in family therapy and the family unit and all of that um so I uh, I know that like every week you would have like a meeting like you would supposed to like meet with your therapist, like have like a one-on-one session, but then like every other week was supposed to be family therapy. So you'd speak with your parents during therapy then. Um, in practice, I'm not sure if it was actually every other week. Um, I don't remember. Um, I then like phone calls on phase one. Um, I think you got your first phone call after like a month. Um, and uh, that was monitored. It was 10, 10 or 15 minutes um, on speakerphone in like the um, like staff office. So it was monitored completely. Um, and yeah, if you got like, I think it was like one a month for like 10, 15 minutes. Right. Um, I can't remember exactly the length. And then you were, you were supposed to write your parents, write your parents once a week. Um, and that was like, I mean, again, like I don't think like you had envelopes I don't think you were supposed to seal them they were definitely um it was definitely screened like they they definitely paid attention to like what you were saying um and monitored that and if you said anything bad um first they um even in the rule book that again like they've I think they've taken off of their website now but you used to be able to find it that they conditioned parents to say that like don't believe any of the terrible things like literally like language exactly like this like don't believe any of the horrible things like your daughter may be saying like this is normal like th- they always do this like conditioning parents to like know that like if a daughter like their daughter is saying like oh this is terrible they do all like x y and z like here um i they condition parents to like ignore it and to think that we're just like trying to manipulate them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, in some of the previous episodes we've done, it it was often, it was often um, 
the the parents would be approached and and be told that if your child speaks mm-hmm. to you in this way it it, it if you respond in a certain way it's either it's either going to set them back or yeah. if your child speaks to this way it's because we've noticed in our therapy sessions with them that they have a very particular way of manipulating people so if they yeah. speak to you like this they are trying to manipulate you in the same way that they've been manipulating us yeah that's that's exactly that's exactly what they do I like they, they prey on the like it's going to set them back if you like indulge what they're saying but then any way that like on the monitor call if you try to be like it's terrible this is terrible like I mean that would just get hung up like you just you wouldn't finish the call and then you would be on phase one for longer and um maybe get like other consequences um who knows and then phase two I think you had weekly phone calls after that um not on speaker, but they were also monitored. Like there were multiple um, girls who would be in like the room on phone calls at the same time. And there would be staff members there like listening to what you were saying. And if the staff member caught you trying to manipulate your parents um, in air quotes uh, or like, you know, like saying anything like then that phone call that ended. And then likely again, you might be dropped or you would lose your phone call or you would be put on what was called like SNS from, you know, the community, which would be that like, you couldn't talk to people. They used that one quite a bit. SNS was like a shorthand for silence and separation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, or um, given work hours, which was basically just uh, some, for some reason they just had a bunch of piles of rocks that you would just go out and shovel for hours. Oh my goodness. Um, so that was, uh, that was um, common. So like, those are like the general sort of consequences that you would get. And then I think like phase three, you could start having more phone calls and I'm not sure, like you got more privileges as you moved up and like you had a little bit more freedom, but you also like were a lot smarter about like not jeopardizing that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Because like they knew how to condition people basically um, to like sort of like comply with the program. And how long were you expected to be in this program for? And was that the amount of time that that you ended up staying? So I don't think that there is a subscribed like length of time for like okay. SRI. Like, okay. um, I, I think that they say that like, it's going to be like m- at least a year. Um, most people were a lot longer. I, um, like I said, like I was like older, they, um, they actually stayed like past my 18th birthday when I was there, because it was actually more of like an academic thing. They were like effectively withholding my, um, uh, high school diploma. Until, oh, so gosh. I like, okay. so I couldn't, and I didn't like, I needed like that is like, I, I didn't really have much of a choice, but to stay. And, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I was at SRA for 14 months, which is on the shorter end. Um, and I, it's pretty much because like, um again on the same thing is that like my parents were there like pretty much only interested in me like graduating high school that time and I think that they would have been a little bit ups- like they I don't think I think that they would have wanted me to leave anyway um had they tried to keep me longer so I think that they realized they couldn't like believe my parents dry anymore basically so uh, overall your total time spent across the two programs was like a year and a half that's a huge amount of time yeah it was a little bit yeah, it was like, I think it was like, yeah, it was like, like, yeah, it was a little bit, but a little bit more than a year and a half, like total. Especially when you thought that you were only leaving for six weeks initially. Yeah. And it was more than a year before I would like, even like go back to like my childhood home, even though like SRA, like where I was, is only an hour drive away from like where I grew up. So did your parents come and pick you up when you were finally able to leave the program? Yeah, there were visits as well as like you got um, through different phases to um, right. phase one, like your parents could visit you on campus. Um, phase two, you could go off campus, but you couldn't leave the state of Arizona. But because I was from Arizona, I also wasn't allowed to be in Phoenix um, where I'm from or go home. So like we have to go somewhere else um for like two days um was like a phase two visit and then phase three they finally let you go home 
um, for like, I don't remember how long, five days maybe, but then you're not allowed to be out of sight of your family. You're not allowed to contact any friends. Um, right, so like, right. that's the other thing is that like, you're completely out of contact. Like I didn't have, when I like finished, like, I don't, I still do. I don't have, didn't have like any friends like afterwards, because like when you're that age and you're like, just gone for that long, like that's kind of like, you kind of lose all of like, you know, your friends from high school and stuff like that. Um, mm, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it was at that age. It's a, it is a long time to just, to just disappear. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So phase three, you're not allowed to like contact like anybody or have any of that. And then phase four, like you have a little bit, like you can go home and then you're allowed to contact what they called working friends. Okay. Um, that was like a, like a, Working, non-working, like, was used all the time. Um, like, I got, like, really confused. It's, like, it can be confusing, like, the, um, like, I thought it was, like, did they have, like, like, I remember, like, mentioning, oh, I have these friends, and then, like, a, like someone's, like, oh, are they working? And then I think, like, well, I mean, you know, they're 16, like, maybe some of them have, like, an after-school job or something like that, but it yeah, meant, yeah. like, more so that, like, um, that they, you know, were, like, you know, went to school and didn't, you know, drink or do drugs or like anything like that. Like they were like good kids versus bad kids, that kind of thing. Or, um, then like, I think on phase four, you could also talk to graduates of SRA. You couldn't talk to people who had been pulled from the program who did not graduate the program. They were inherently not working, even if they were like actually doing fine. Um, and then you were allowed to talk to graduates if they were working. So like basically on that end, um, so you were allowed to, but then like at that point, it's like, what did, did I have? Like, I didn't really have anyone to like talk to or, or do or like see or anything <laughs> then either. And then like at that point too, like you're so focused on, um, you're so focused on like trying to like just leave and like get out of there. But a lot of times, like, you know, you're not going to jeopardize, um, yeah, especially yeah. when you're on like phase four, you're not, like, which is like, you know, like the last hurdle before graduation, you're not going to try to jeopardize like anything. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Even though it feels like a, the whole path is laid with landmines and, and anything you do or say could, it uh, could end you or could, could put you in a place of, mm -hmm. of, as you said, kind of jeopardizing the 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 work or journey that you've done so far. Oh yeah, I just think on um phase four, like I like honestly, I wasn't like a huge like I kind of learned how to toe the line like quite a bit. But I remember on phase four when I was like allowed to like you know talk to people or use the internet or whatever. Like there was another friend um, of mine who had been in the program. Like we got to SRA around the same time, and then she had been pulled from the program and then she got sent back to it, to SRA. And um, she's sadly, she's no longer, um, she passed away a couple of years ago. But um, this person, like, I remember, like, I was like, cause she just got randomly and she had a, I was like sending, like co contacting her like boyfriend for her, like um, away. And she never told anybody what she could have, which would have been like, you know, uh, like great collateral for her. Yeah, she had yeah. a really tough time there. And like, so she never told anybody that I was doing it and like, I did it for her. So she was like, that was kind of like a little thing that like, I would try to do that kind of stuff. And then also like on, on, then I would also like, I think I had a couple of friends who were pulled from the program, um, that on Facebook, like I then contacted, like when I was home and stuff too, that like, I wasn't supposed to, um, but like, I, I think you just like knew like at one point, like who to tell or who not to tell or like yeah. what stuff just to keep to yourself yeah. and everything. So what, what did your journey out of the program and your re reintegration into kind of your home life and everyday life, what did that look like? Um, like after I graduated, um, mm -hmm. I, like, I mean, it was like, it was like really tough, um, for a while. Like I lived at home for a, so to actually give a little bit of context, um, right after I turned 18, I, um, had tried to, uh, like I had been home, gone, went home on a visit. Um, and I like determined, I was like, okay, I'm not going back. And, I uh, like after like that, like, and then, um, eventually like they kept like, 
there's a lot of other tactics like how they catch me there with like coming up with like like absolutely like like nonsense like classes I had to take in order to finish like high school and stuff like that or like not letting me take certain things that I needed um in order to graduate and that's how they got me back because like I was like fine I just need to like be able to finish this and then um when I got back to SRA like that was like I remember like being the subject of what they called like a feedback group um, which is basically like about like the entire school and like Jeannie, the, um, like woman who owned the school was there too. And like, it was like this whole like attack session about how, um, like, you know, I didn't care enough, like, like to be there, like why I wanted to leave and like all of mm-hmm, these things mm-hmm. about like, um, like how, like I made people sick. And if I'd left, like, I was just going to end up like, you know, dead, like in a gutter somewhere, or, like, you know, prostituting myself for drugs or things like that. Um, so they, and like, I think at that point, like I just was kind of like numb to everything because like, I don't know, but I think like there had been so much that had been drilled into me that like, I, I think I truly believed that I was an addict, um, even though like now I know that I am not. Mm-hmm. Um, so that I, I, like when I graduated, I lived at home for a couple months cause I didn't have any money. Um, Mm -hmm. and hadn't had a job or anything. And then I was finally able to like move out and, um, lived in a really sort of like honest, because I didn't really want much to do with my parents. Um, at that point, I still don't have a very good relationship with my parents um, now. Um, it wasn't like a good environment for me to live in. So like I moved out and then, um, moved into like a pretty bad living situation. Um, and started actually like doing like not like anything like I got scared like early on but started actually doing like drugs somewhat like um not even like that regularly but like it scared me enough that like I thought that like I was like some crazy like addict and um I ended up um going to like a proper rehab um and ended up sort of like being in recovery and like then being like sort of uh going through like the AA program, which is also very, I I have my own thoughts on like AA as well. And all of that. Yes. Um, Yeah. But I, which I mean, I think is maybe not necessarily, I don't know. It's very culty, cult-like itself, especially like in like a rehab community and stuff like that. And um, Mm -hmm. I really struggled um, to try to like live a life that was, um, for, for like a number of years, like I really struggled to try to like figure out how to like actually be like an adult outside of like a therapeutic sort of setting. Um, and then, um, I don't know, like eventually I just, like I'm doing okay now. Like eventually I feel like I just kind of like figured it out and like I, I'm doing okay now, but mm. it's been, you know, it's been 10 years. So Absolutely. I, yeah. Yeah. Well, this um, is usually the last question I ask people before they, before, before asking if if there's anything that that they think we've missed that we should cover and that is Mm -hmm. to ask you know you've talked about AA but how that might not necessarily be the best solution for people in these situations especially because I I'm not sure you were ever really an addict in the first place and required that type of service Um, yeah but but my question usually is what have you done to promote your healing process what advice would you give to others that have had similar experiences um and and what 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 was the best course of action for you in these last 10 years in working through you've mentioned sort of reading up and researching a lot but what what was the best thing for you in terms of recovering from your from your trauma um well I think that I think that like the first bit of it was like, I think that initially, like I tried really hard and for a long time to pretend it hadn't happened or to minimize what had happened or to just pretend like that wasn't a part of my life and never to talk about it. Mm. Um, And then uh, now, I mean, I think that sort of acknowledging it and um, realizing that like, no, this was wrong. This shouldn't have happened. And like, it actually like realizing that like it is trauma that I need to like 
recover from that I'm not crazy. And that like trying to be a little bit more kind to myself, I think that is sort of like acknowledge that like I did go through something like intensely traumatic that like I, you know, it's not something that like, I, I think being a little bit kinder to myself that like I've gone through like phases where I've been like, well, this was like so long ago, like you should just be over it. Like, it's fine. Everything's fine now. Like you're not here anymore. Um, so I think that like trying, trying to like give myself a little bit of credit, trying to be a little bit more kind to myself, um, has been immensely helpful. Um, I luckily have like a, like a really, um, supportive partner and, um, really great friends who, um, like I have felt like comfortable with like opening up to and like, who know, like what I've gone through and yeah, like, yeah. um, like in the past, like it's only been in the past year, year and a half or so that I've really actually started like, like seeing a therapist, um, properly. and like actually like working through this in therapy and like realize that like therapy isn't necessarily supposed to be like a confrontational experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which I mean, like, I remember like, 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 yeah. So, I mean, that has helped too, but I think that like, I mean, like I still get nightmares, um, now. And like, I feel like, I know I'm doing a lot better than I used to, but like, I still get nightmares that like I'm there or like something's happened. And like, they figured out some loophole that like gets me sent back there and like, I can't leave or something like that. Um, that I, I mean, I still, I still get, and I think that like, like now, um, yeah, I do think just like trying to be more kind to myself about like understanding like this is a traumatic experience. This happens like there's reasons like I can't listen to certain songs. Like there mm-hmm. are like things that like I like like I'm sensitive to. Like I'm not great at accepting criticism because I take it way too personally. And like I'm trying to work through that, but like also like trying to be like look, this person is like probably just trying to help you and like probably doesn't like really hate you and like all of that you know what I mean so I think that trying to put things in context have been uh but it's been it's it's not easy I think no and I think that what you've said there is extremely important in terms of cutting yourself some slack and realizing Mm -hmm. that there may be things that that you'll encounter throughout your life that will be difficult that will be triggering and understanding that there's a reason behind those things and and knowing that it's okay to have those reactions to those things that you encounter because of the experiences that you've had so so what you said there about you know being kind to yourself is 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 a very positive and important message to put out to any of the listeners who could be going through their own process of of healing and and recovering from their own trauma yeah the other thing that I actually want to say on that as well is that I think for me that like I had a lot of guilt um I think because I think that I had maybe a bit of an easier time like it or I didn't have it as bad as some people did in some ways and I think that like taking time to realize that like just because you didn't have it like whatever it is like I didn't have it as bad as some people and like understanding you know, that some people might have gone through also bad things doesn't like minimize like what's happened to me to try to understand that like, you know, like pain and trauma is relative. And um, I think that also like sometimes I've had a lot of guilt about um, just certain um, people I was really close with or friends and things who are not doing well or are um, no longer like with us. Um, Mm -hmm. I've Mm -hmm. had a lot of kind of like survivor guilt a little bit of like, how come I'm okay? How come I did okay? And I think that like, just trying to like stop that kind of thinking has been like really hard to do. And I think that like, that's like another thing is like, I think it's not a unique feeling that like I have there and to like understand that and to kind of be a little bit more active and like in like survivor communities and stuff like that. Like I spend a lot of time Mm -hmm. on like Mm -hmm. the, um, like subreddit, the, uh, troubled teens. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, subreddit that like um kind of like when I like like realized that existed like it made me feel so much less alone um because I had distanced myself so much from uh any of this like Esther I talked to one person um from there and uh I think that like it it made me feel like less alone with some like the really like complex stuff that I was like trying to process and like Sometimes like, you know, if I was like trying to talk to like a friend about it or something like that, then like, 
something that like I know is like horrifying or bad or whatever that I would come up with a story like instead of like I don't necessarily like want their sympathy there's part of me that just wants to be like yeah remember when this crazy thing happened like how funny was that like that kind of thing which sometimes feels a little bit better than having to be like no that was wrong and like super fucked up like yeah yeah but so um, uh, that yeah. uh, that as well, I think, is something that's important to to mention again. That, that as you just said there, with the survivor guilt, um, it's it's again um, a difficult subject, and and comes back to the different experiences that people will have had, and understanding that you you know you didn't you you didn't necessarily encourage the situation you were put into an abusive em- environment that that you had absolutely no control over and what your life is like now or the experiences that you've had since then again you know you should never feel guilty for um so what you mentioned there about survivor guilt I think is also a very important point to bring up uh, especially for for anyone listening who may have experienced or is experiencing those things as well um so I've been through all of my questions here Maggie unless there's anything else you you want to add I think we've covered the tip of the iceberg today yeah I think that um like most of it like I think that like we've covered like basically I I guess I should ask if Spring Ridge is still active and and still running yeah it is um it's uh like I think that they had a lot of like negative uh like I think actually like people have been completely like um flooding their Google reviews and so they only have like one star okay and um but uh they recently like released a statement saying that a small group of like just satisfied students are trying to like defame um them which uh isn't true uh (laughs) it's not a small group is like what I mean. It's that like, I think a lot of people um, have like serious trauma from this. Um, but yeah, they're still operating run by um, Jeannie, uh, the CEO um, retired, uh, I don't know, a number of years ago. Cause I actually remember there was like some crazy retirement party for her in which like they wanted like people to pay to attend like, <laughs> like a hundred bucks a head or something so they could like watch a slideshow or like, like talk about how amazing she was. Um, and so she could sit there and hear about how she saved people's lives. Uh, so she retired, but now it's being run by her son and daughter-in-law. And she, um, I believe still comes back to facilitate the trainings, um, the seminars, right, which okay. are like another like major, like part of that too. Um, I didn't get like, I am really hazy about like everything that happens in them still, but like, that's like, I mean, a good source of like my trauma, like really comes from those seminars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is, which is not surprising, uh, at all. Yeah. So yeah, it's still, it's still fully operational. Um, there have been like, um, some like more recent survivors, I think like from like 20, I think it's hard, like when you first get out, because like, I, like, I know speaking from my own experience about like how much you just want to pretend that was just a phase of my life that didn't happen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but like, I think I've seen some people from like, as like recent as like 2016, 2017, um, like it sounds like not that much has changed. Um, it looks, the actual campus looks quite a bit nicer from when I was there, which I think like helps sell it a lot more to parents. And yeah, like that, yeah. Because like their main thing is like, look how fancy this looks. Um, right. But um, like very like, you know, green grass in the middle of the desert. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, isn't that, isn't that in, in kind of all the tropes of, of films, isn't that always what we're taught? Like, oh, look, it's a mirage. The mirage is yeah. perfect in the desert. So is that, you know, it's kind of like what, what, we're, what we are taught through, through kind of mass consumption of things like um, media, television, films and things like that. Um, so if, if I saw that, I'd probably be like, whoa, look at this. This is incredible. Look at this place yeah. in the middle of the desert, looking all green and luscious and inviting and appealing. And then on yeah. the inside, it's just like absolutely none of those things. I remember like when um, 
like I was first talking about it with my, my therapist and she looked up the website for it. And she's like, look, I'm looking at it and, you know, you see these photos on the website and you can see how parents would be conned into thinking like this is a great place to send yeah. people. And she's yeah. like, but speaking as a psychiatrist, this is clearly a cult. Wow. Okay. So she, <laughs> so she knew from your experiences that that's exactly what was happening inside the walls of, of the place that looks really lovely on the outside. Yeah. And like, I mean, it's, yeah. So, and like I said, so like, I think the fundamental, um, the, the fundamental like way the program is run and everything I believe is pretty much exactly the same. Um, I don't really think that much has changed there. Um, well, Since with more and more I've people coming forward and more and more people speaking out and them already releasing a statement saying people are trying to defame us and, and tear down our reputation. If they yeah. haven't changed anything that they are doing, I don't know how places like this can expect to last much longer because the stories like yours today and the people speaking out, they are very powerful and they are very true and they are very ongoing. So I don't know... I hope these, I hope the the staff in these places are squirming a little bit and getting a bit worried and thinking about maybe reforming from the inside instead of it having enforced on them because it, it hopefully in my mind is inevitable. Yeah, I hope so. Like, I mean, I think that like why it kind of, like, I think that like, it's like where I say, I think that I've, I've struggled with the survivor guilt and sometimes like what's kind of helped me or like not helped me, but sort of like given me some understanding is that like a lot of people, I mean, myself included, um, but a lot of people like, you know, were sent there and went there, like had serious issues that they needed to work on and needed help for. Um, and they weren't given that they weren't given anything and were just like myself like honestly like I don't really know even if I've gotten to the point of like talking about the things that got me sent away in the first time because I've spent the past like decade trying to unpack the like shit that happened like while I was you know yeah 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 yeah, yeah. like Absolutely. sent away like while I was in these programs so um like I I think that um like the real heartbreaking thing is like more so is that like people are being sent away because they like his parents are conned most of the time into thinking that they're going to get some help for their child. Mm -hmm. And um, that is like far from what actually happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think again, that's, that's another great thing to, to highlight. Um, So we've spoken a lot about different things here. We've managed to cram into our just over two hours of chatting your experiences mm-hmm. across two different programs, which in themselves seem to be using cult-like methods of control, which mm-hmm. which in their own right have respectively given you lots of lots of things to think about and lots of grief over the years since leaving each program. Um, so thank you so much for for coming on the show for for trusting me with your story for going through speaking about these experiences which you mentioned you kind of laugh about off the cuff sometimes and um and maybe kind of joke about with other people that had been through these experiences but i understand that it's probably if you if you kind of don't compartmentalize or or desensitize yourself to the things that you're talking about if you actually were to sit down and think about them I'm sure it's very difficult and and uh, and not humorous in any way whatsoever so I do appreciate the 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 scale of emotion that comes with with coming to chat with with me about about this subject and to relive these experiences and to inform people who have experienced similar things of of your experience but also to inform people that that have never attended a program like this before that uh, about the things that are still happening in over in America and other places in the world Mm -hmm. um and to to bring attention to institutionalized abuse that that has there has to be some type of legal reform at some point something has to change because this is 2021 and these programs have been running since 70s and 80s and 90s plus and and it shouldn't be the same as it was then um so thank you so much for for joining us today for sharing your story 
and for bringing more light to to an industry that absolutely has to change yeah thanks for having me i'm happy to I'm happy to uh, like uh talk about it fantastic thank you so much maggie and enjoy the rest of your day yeah you too cheers bye bye that is the end of this week's episode to get in touch you can email me at coltvaultpodcast at gmail.com or follow me on twitter and instagram at coltvaultpod i'm your speaker casey and this has been the cult vault